Thank you so much to the municipality of Budapest for this invitation. Thank you to um, the Netherlands Embassy here in, in Hungary for the support. Without their support, uh, we wouldn't be able to, to do this event tonight. So uh, with that, I will get rolling with uh, a short introduction on our organization. And if you haven't uh, crossed paths with the Dutch Cycling Embassy yet, um, we are a, uh, a non-profit foundation that was founded 13 years ago by the Dutch national government as a form of bicycle diplomacy. We're uh, a knowledge sharing organization. We work with cities around the world to learn best practice from the Netherlands. Um, and uh, well, we have a small team of 12 people uh, based in Utrecht. Um, but uh, well, we have quite an extensive network of organizations in the Netherlands that we cooperate with. So. Um, when we get these requests from cities, we're able to put together experts, teams of experts from uh, these various organizations. It's over 100 and counting now from both the public and private sector. It's engineers, planners, consultants, producers. Uh, and on the public side, there's a, a number of municipalities, universities, the railway companies, uh, and they all bring their own specific expertise to the table for uh, whatever kind of activity we have. Uh, and every activity is unique and it's tailor-made to the city that we're working with. Sometimes it's a simple email exchange, a series of video calls, um, but we do like to do the bulk of our work in a face-to-face -face setting. That is um, bringing study visits, groups of decision makers to the Netherlands, getting them on a bike, getting them inspired, informed, visiting cities like Rotterdam, Amsterdam, Utrecht, Delft, where I'm lucky enough to live. Um, but also getting them in a classroom setting so that they can understand what they just experienced, how it came to be, and how it might be transferable to their own context. Inversely, we do a lot of uh, what we call Think Bike workshops where we're bringing the Dutch expertise to those cities. Uh, and we do yeah, 30 or 40 of these workshops a year where we're sitting down for three days with uh, all of the local stakeholders bringing uh, a number of uh, the Dutch experts to the table, introducing some of these principles and best practices, and then rolling up our sleeves and doing actual work on actual projects that that city is working on uh, in a case study format. We're going to do a, an abbreviated version of that tomorrow morning, which I'm very much looking forward to. Uh, we're going to cram three days of content down into three hours. So uh, that promises to be a very exciting endeavor. So. Why did the Dutch cycle is the title of the session. And I think if you ask a person on the street, they will give you probably the same thing that we often read in the comments section of our uh, social media feeds. That is the Dutch cycle because it's flat, because the weather is nice, uh, because the they have this magical Dutch DNA that uh, makes them morally superior to the rest of the world. All of that is, is, is well, the first two are, are kind of true anyways. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it really, to me, it vastly underestimates and underplays the importance of the infrastructure. And as Ruth said in the film, the really important and, and kind of mundane political struggles that happened in their cities uh, that ended up with them choosing not to prioritize motor car traffic in their cities and to prioritize walking and cycling and public transportation. This is a, a heat map of the cycling paths in Europe. You can almost draw a line on the German and Belgian borders. The density of, of cycle paths in the Netherlands is that high. It's now nearly 40,000 kilometers of fully segregated cycle paths, another 60,000 kilometers of low traffic, mixed uh, traffic uh, cycling routes. And so those really combine to create this door-to-door -door network that make it possible to cycle from virtually anywhere to everywhere and make cycling the first choice for a lot of their residents. But as you saw in the film, it wasn't always that way. And, and I think this is also something that a lot of Dutch people have completely forgotten about. Um, much like you know, the rest of the world, in the decades after the Second World War, they were making space for car in their, the cars in their cities. They were. Uh, told by the technocrats that the car was the mobility mode of the future uh, and everybody had to adapt their lives and their cities around the automobile. 
this is a famous photo of Amsterdam, but it could be virtually any city in the Netherlands. Um, they were absolutely flooded with cars and making space for cars, and that is widening their streets, demolishing, demolishing their historic buildings, filling in their canals in some cases uh, where they, uh, in Utrecht, um, and it's only in response to a very, uh, well, a perfect storm of crises in the early 1970s, uh, just in the nick of time, as, as Ruth says in the film, uh, that really kind of create this inflection point uh, for Dutch urban and transport planning. What are those historical events? Well, I could uh, do an entire presentation on them uh, or write an entire book on them, as has been done. Uh, and, but to really simplify, there were two converging crises that happened in and around the same time that really, again, served as light bulb moments for both the population and the political classes. That is a road safety crisis that was, well, uh, as you saw in the film, was killing uh, thousands of Netherlanders each and every year, including a significant portion of children. Uh, and it really sparked a movement, a protest movement, uh, called Stop the Child Murder, uh, that was taken from a headline of a newspaper editor who wrote an editorial one morning. Uh, his daughter was tragically killed on her cycle ride to school, and so he poured all of his grief, all of his frustration into this front page editorial, and it lit a fire across the country uh, as people took to the streets because they could see cars were taking away uh, the children's space to walk, to cycle, and to play. Uh, and so they demanded more from their elected officials, uh, and fortunately, or unfortunately, uh, for the automobile industry, in and around that time, uh, there was an OPEC uh, oil crisis, an embargo for six weeks, where the price of gasoline increased significantly, the sale of bicycles doubled. Um, this light bulb moment uh, in the Dutch population occurred because they could suddenly see all of the space that had been given to the cars in their cities. They could cycle on the arterial roads, they could have picnics in the middle of the freeways. Um, and, and of course, there was this uh, understanding amongst the population, but perhaps more importantly at the political level, an understanding that, um, well, a, a one-sided car-based transportation system is very fragile and susceptible to outside shocks and interferences, whether it is a research a resource shortage whether it is uh, an extreme weather event, whether it is a global pandemic, uh, the more we can do to build a more balanced and diversified mobility system, the more resilient our mobility systems are for the challenges ahead. And that's basically the decision that was made in the Netherlands, not to ban the car from their cities, but to build better balance between walking, cycling, public transportation, and still keeping a place for the private car in their streets. In the decades after that inflection point, as uh, Mark uh, describes in the movie, there were decades of, of trial and error because there was no guidebook to building cycling infrastructure at the time. There were no best practices that had been established. Municipalities across the Netherlands were just throwing stuff on the ground and seeing what worked and what didn't work. And uh, in combination with the, the guidance and the financing of the national government, they did some demonstration projects. Some of them were successful. Some of them weren't success uh, so successful. Um, but they really, I think, learned a lot of lessons along the way, which really have kind of resulted in this holistic uh, and integrated approach between the hardware, the software, and the hardware. And as Aaron uh, hinted in his, uh, his introduction, and we're going to spend a lot of time on this in the workshop tomorrow, it's not just about building infrastructure and hoping that people will use it. There really has to be a concerted effort, not just to change the infrastructure, but to change uh, the behavior uh, patterns of the people using that infrastructure, whether they're on foot, bicycle, car, or public transportation. And there's also institutional changes that need to be made, of course, uh, from the decision-making level all the way down um, so that uh, various departments are talking to each other, cooperating with each other, to make sure they're all working towards the same goal. So that trial and error process really kind of reached a breakthrough point in Delft. And, and I am, as I said, I'm lucky enough to live in Delft uh, and, and now enjoy the fruits of this uh, experiment uh, all these decades later. But after the, the demonstration projects in Tilburg and The Hague, which were just individual cycle paths that didn't really connect anything with anything, um, the decision was made uh, to 
build an entire grid of cycle uh, infrastructure, to build a network. Uh, and it's actually not just one network, but three overlapping networks. You can see in the green, in the blue, and the red there. Uh, each different types of infrastructure, there's segregated cycle paths, but there's also local streets where uh, the speed and the volume of cars is reduced to the point where uh, cycling can still be used without having to physically separate the bikes and cars. Um, but they really set about in a concerted way uh, connecting the residential areas with the uh, office areas, but also the shops, the restaurants, the schools, the public transport facilities, to make all of those trips that we take throughout the day possible on a bicycle. And, and as I said, this was the breakthrough, um, the number of people, the diversity of people cycling uh, increased dramatically almost overnight as soon as this network was opened. Uh, and this really became the blueprint for cities across the Netherlands and now cities around the world uh, who are building networks and building them fairly quickly in Seville, in Calgary, uh, in other cities. Uh, and they're using these five principles that were established in Delft that a, a cycling network needs to reflect uh, directness, safety, cohesion, uh, attractiveness, and comfort. And if you're checking all five of those boxes, then you're on, long on your way to becoming a cycling city. The cohesion uh, aspect of that is incredibly important, and as uh, cities, including Delft, were building out their networks, there was an understanding that the intersection was the weak link of those networks. Uh, and unfortunately, still today, we see uh, cities are building beautiful segregated cycle paths and then giving up at the intersection because it's too difficult or too complicated. Uh, and engineers in the Netherlands really set about uh, solving this problem through uh, what is now referred to as the protected intersection, uh, that is providing these uh, bulb outs at the corners that force right turning traffic to take a more 90 degree uh, route, uh, forcing them to slow down and pay attention a little bit more. That mid block refuge that's also provided, also incredibly important. And then where side streets intersect with arterial roads, as you can see in the bottom left. Um, where we would see perhaps elsewhere in the world the cycle path again disappear into no man's land uh, and the cycling pedestrian have to step down into the car space. The inverse is actually happening. The foot and cycle path is kept in a raised, continuous and prioritized position uh, and the, it's actually the car driver that has to come up into the <coughs> cyclist or pedestrian space. So we're reversing that sense of entitlement and, and flipping it on its head. The bicycle network is incredibly important. We could spend an entire uh, evening just talking about that, but I would also uh, argue that the taking a look at the car network is just as important, if not more important. And this is kind of the invisible hand uh, of Dutch planning that you perhaps won't experience if you, or, or notice visibly uh, when you visit a Dutch city, but it's happening almost everywhere. And it's uh, a very simple but strict hierarchy of streets a network of streets that is pushing the through traffic to perimeter roads, stopping that through traffic from filtering through uh, the residential and commercial areas. Uh, and so it makes a lot of those streets, yeah, much more safe and much more comfortable, but it also increases the time competitiveness of cycling within the city. And, and you heard a bit about Groningen in the film. They were kind of the first to create this type of circulation plan. Uh, and now a, a two minute cycle ride in the city center uh, would require a 12-minute car ride because the driver has to come out and circ <coughs> circumnavigate the city on a perimeter ring road. Safety, yeah, I mean, everything that Dutch cities do really come down to making their streets more safe, sparked by this road safety crisis in the 1970s. You heard about the, the policy changes that were made at the national level in the 1990s. Sustainable safety was one of those policies, and it's still, yeah, it, it guides every decision that's made to the road network. Uh, and it really starts in a lot of ways with trying to create a perfect road system rather than trying to create the perfect road user. Um, we're seeing elsewhere in the world cities trying to educate and enforce their way to road safety uh, with very, not a great deal of success. Uh, the Dutch emphasis is very much on engineering with an understanding that people will make mistakes, human error is inevitable, and that we can design streets in a more forgiving way uh, so that those mistakes don't result in serious injury or death. Speed management becomes an incredibly important part of this. 
you heard in the film, 30 kilometers an hour is now almost 80% uh, uh, in cities across the Netherlands. It's not putting up uh, a sign or painting 30 on the ground. It is really uh, designing streets that the driver has to travel 30 kilometers an hour through narrowing, through chicanes, through changes in texture, through the introduction of speed tables. Uh, speeding is not seen, again, as an education or enforcement problem. It's seen as an engineering problem. And if there's too much speeding, the street is often sent back to uh, the engineers to redesign. And then a more recent development, but this has really become, in a lot of ways, the backbone of the Dutch mobility system is uh, the intermodality between cycling and the public transportation system and how cycling is now used through the provision, well, the design of the infrastructure, the provision of free, secure bike parking at the train stations, uh, a rental bike at the other end of the journey in the, the blue and yellow Ove feats, uh, a door-to-door -door seamless mobility option by combining the cycling and the public transport across huge distances, hundreds of kilometers if needed. Uh, I, I use it every day to get, well, a couple times a week to get from my house in Delft to the office in Utrecht. It's about a 70 kilometer journey, but it, it has this benefit of feeding more passengers into the public transport system because it increases the catchment area of that stop or station, uh, but also putting more cyclists onto the cycle paths because uh, the two modes really reinforce each other, they support each other, uh, and to the point where now in the Netherlands half of all the train journeys start with a bicycle ride and a quarter of all the kilometers cycled in their cities are to or from a railway station. I did de-emphasize the need for education, but it's not to say that it doesn't have its place. And, and uh, it is, in the Netherlands, it's very much targeted towards teaching new road users, uh, uh, often in elementary school, um, how to safely navigate the infrastructure that they're building for them. Um, almost every child in the Netherlands receives this traffic safety education. It's part of the school curriculum in the classroom. There is a practical exam, as you saw in the film, where uh, the children ride a course through their city and uh, receive a certificate at the end of this test. Uh, and this becomes a rite of passage as children leave elementary school and go into secondary school that they are now ready to navigate the city on their own without mom or dad having to supervise or chaperone them. And then there is the introduction of the electric bike, which is, uh, hasn't been without its challenges, but. Uh, I think, uh, obviously, really like to focus on the, the positives that have come with the rise of the e-bike in the Netherlands. And per capita, the Netherlands is actually the country uh, that has embraced the e-bike more than any other, despite the fact that it is as flat as a pancake and, uh, you know, fairly compact. But um, it has, of course, allowed the elderly population, for example, to continue cycling into uh, their golden years. Uh, they're still disproportionately used by... Uh, women, but uh, at the end of the day, it is really about inviting more people into cycling uh, and extending the range of cycling by uh, just providing a little bit of electric assistance. So there's lots of now, uh, the national government has provided all these incentives that, that were really sparked during the pandemic in the hope that they could get more people e-cycling between cities. Uh, the provision of new types of cycling infrastructure, these cycle superhighways in between cities, but also added in incentives, a per kilometer reimbursement, uh, a, the ability to lease or purchase a bike through your work for a very subsidized rate. These are little things that we can do to uh, provide a, a replacement for the car journey. Uh, no longer talking about short trips of three to five kilometers. Now the electric bike is, makes these trips of 10 or 15 kilometers perfectly uh, possible and also time competitive. So those are kind of the ingredients of a cycling city. They're the hardware and software and orgware of, 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 uh, that kind of explain why the Netherlands is where they are. And, and I won't go through all of these statistics. There's a lot of numbers there. Uh, but I think the one that really stands out to me is um, that the, uh, it's not just the metropolitan areas that have accomplished this. You know, it's 202 municipalities across the country where the cycling mode share exceeds the car mode share. So it is small villages and towns. It is the Amsterdams and Rotterdams. But they've really taken these standards that were applied or, or handed down by the national government and applied them to virtually 
every context across the country and, and provided us, as I said at the start, with a blueprint that now can be replicable in other parts of the world. So those are the, the quantitative benefits of cycling, and they're fairly obvious. We know that cycling uh, reduces carbon emissions, increases public health, reduces traffic congestion, but I really want to kind of hammer home the intangible benefits, the qualitative benefits that come with building great cycling infrastructure, providing people with alternatives to the car, and, and a lot of these demographics that I'll talk about in, in this part of the, uh, the topic uh, of my talk are currently excluded from a car-based transportation system, uh, and they're certainly not brought in when we have these discussions about mobility or, or uh, public space. They're uh, often left at the sidelines, and, and uh, well, I, I'll start uh, by talking a little bit about the child-friendly city, because this is really kind of the reason why I left Canada and, and packed up and moved to the Netherlands uh, when I did six years ago was uh, our experience of visiting the Netherlands, we were really kind of blown away by the vast number of children and teenagers that were cycling around in groups uh, completely unsupervised by uh, parents or, or chaperones. Uh, and uh, this, uh, if you're born and raised in the Netherlands, this is the most normal thing in the world. To an outsider, this is the most beautiful thing in the world because uh, elsewhere we see kids are now growing up in the back seat of their parents' cars. Uh, they are taken everywhere, uh, completely supervised, chaperoned, uh, and it's terrible for their physical and mental health. It's terrible for their development, uh, and uh, it's not a coincidence in, in our mind that uh, Dutch kids are regularly ranked amongst the happiest in the world, and it's oversimplistic to say that it's just about the bikes, but uh, there is really a lot to be said to providing children with that freedom, that autonomy, uh, to move around the city on their own terms, uh, to not have to be uh, mom or dad as, as taxi driver, uh, and to, uh, at the end of the day, yeah, learn to make mistakes, to be resilient, to be exposed to the weather, and, and to hopefully grow up into uh, well-balanced young adults. Connected to that is the experience of the caregiver, and this is, again, another group that we often don't measure or talk about uh, it is still disproportionately done by women, um, but that is certainly improving. And at the end of the day, it really is about uh, measuring and designing for what is called the mobility of care. And that is the non-economic uh, trips that the caregiver of the house take throughout the day, not the single purpose, long distance commute from the house to the office, but <coughs> short multi-purpose journeys, more in a spider web pattern. Uh, from the house to drop the kids off at school, run to the grocery store, uh, maybe take care of elderly relatives, pick up some cleaning supplies, go to the office, and then do it all over again on the way home. And uh, because we've prioritized the, the commute and, and often the car traffic, uh, this is really left as an afterthought. And so these types of trips, this type of trip chaining, is really can be quite stressful, quite difficult. Uh, and one of the reasons I, I would suggest that women cycle in greater numbers than men uh, is because they are still responsible for a lot of the care journeys uh, and these types of fine-grained walking and cycling networks really support this type of trip chaining uh, and trips that are being taken closer to home uh, by the caregiver of the house, whether they happen to be male or female. People with disabilities are often used by um, opponents to uh, cycling as a, uh, an excuse not to do anything. And, and uh, this is something we still see quite frequently, again, in the comments section of our uh, social media feed is uh, we're often called ableist or, or disadvantaging of people with disabilities because we want to create space for cycling or perhaps remove some parking spaces. I'm always, uh, well, I never engage in those, uh, those online conversations anyways, but I think it's important to actually uh, differentiate between people who have legitimate concerns about people with disabilities and people who are using them as a bad faith argument to maintain the status quo. What we do know is that in a lot of countries, uh, it's up to two thirds of people with disabilities do not have access to a car for physical, financial reasons, and so, uh, they are often crammed on a footpath or on a public transportation system that doesn't cater to their needs. 
the cycling infrastructure in the Netherlands has become this really a third place between the footpath, between uh, the motor traffic for a wide range of mobility devices. And they are no longer just two-wheeled bicycles, but more tricycles, hand cycles, recumbent cycles, uh, scoot mobiles, which are kind of motorized wheelchair that you see in the bottom left corner. Um, for people with a disability, these become uh, who don't necessarily have a driver's license or the ability to drive a car, uh, these become a lifeline for them to continue participating in society uh, and grant them the same freedom and autonomy that uh, perhaps they, they wouldn't have uh, or they did have before their, their driver's license was taken away. So um, lots we could say about this, but I think the last point I will make is that the details really do matter and, and it really comes down to the inclusive way that the infrastructure is designed uh, to make sure that there's plenty of curb cuts, uh, the, the, uh, the curb between the cycle path and the footpath is often splayed so it is mountable uh, for people in a mobility device. The asphalt is always super smooth, there's clear visual cues between uh, the foot and cycle path and, and uh, the design manuals require these gentle gradients, that is uh, low slopes when we're uh, going down into a tunnel or up onto a bridge. And so there's lots of things we can do if we uh, set them in the design standards to make sure that anybody can use the cycling infrastructure and not just the fit and the brave. I did talk about the bike train combination and, and I think this is, uh, again, one of the, the backbones of the Dutch mobility system. And it's of course bigger than just mobility. It really, at the end of the day, it comes down to uh, providing people with access to opportunity and, and uh, the statistic I often point to is that it's now uh, four-fifths of the population of the Netherlands are within seven and a half kilometers of a railway station. That is, you know, a 20, 30-minute cycle ride uh, that provides them with the same access to opportunity, whether they live further out of the city or in a suburban, exurban area or a village. They're still able to access uh, education, healthcare, employment uh, without having to necessarily own and operate a car and the numbers we often don't talk about but they are uh, you know in uh, upwards of 10,000 euros now uh, in most EU countries to own and operate a car throughout a year for maintenance, gasoline, insurance, uh, etc. And so if we can liberate people from what is often the, up to a third of their income that's being used for transportation um, to provide them the same access to opportunities that is uh, the key to perhaps unlocking the bike train combination. And then the final demographic uh, that I will talk about um, because, uh, well, it's the other end of the age bracket. I started with children. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, senior citizens because, um, again, by, by assuming that everyone can drive everywhere all of the time, we've really kind of lock this car dependency into uh, what is now an aging baby boom generation and we all eventually outlive our ability to drive safely. The American Automobile Association says seven to ten years we will outlive our ability to drive a car. Um, when that happens, when the driver's license gets taken away, well we're often housebound, institutionalized, dependent on our elderly children for uh, a ride. Um, and, uh, well, it doesn't have to be that way, and, and uh, uh, one of my favorite statistics about cycling in the Netherlands is that it's actually the 65 to 75 demographic that cycles the most out of all adult categories. Uh, so again, it's not just about uh, a young uh, fitness activity, uh, it, it's really a, a, a means of continued participation in society for uh, people who are getting older, they're still able to uh, meet with friends, do their shopping, go to the community center and, and everywhere in between without feeling like if they lose their driver's license then they're going to lose everything. So um, yeah, this is a, a, perhaps a, a difficult conversation to have with this uh, silver tsunami as, as they say of, of baby boomers reaching this age but we really need to talk about giving them the ability to age in place, to age in the cities where they grow up uh, and walking, cycling, public and tr transportation can play a role in that. So I will leave you with um, a rhetorical question. Obviously, a, uh, I wish it was a, a satirical question. Um, this is, uh, on the left, really an actual uh, 
rendering a, a, a vision of the future of uh, mobility from the Peloton Corporation. Um, and in all seriousness, you know, especially after the pandemic where people are still seeing their cars as a piece of personal protective equipment, um, left to their own devices, the, the Silicon Valley, the automotive industry will just throw some technology onto car dependency and, and not really change very much. And we might be exercising in our cars, sleeping in our cars, uh, working in our cars. Uh, but it doesn't change the fundamental problems of car dependency and car dominance in the city. It's not either or. The autonomous vehicle certainly has its place. Uh, but we do really need to talk about building more healthy, more social, uh, and more spatial, spatially efficient uh, modes of transportation. That's my two kids uh, cycling through Amsterdam the first time in 2016. Uh, it was really life-changing for them and, and really when we were given the opportunity to move to the, uh, the Netherlands, they did not hesitate for a moment. Uh, and every time we talk about the possibility of going back to Canada, they say no way. So um, with that, I will thank you for your attention. Uh, I will encourage you, if you want to learn more about what I've talked about, I've, I've co-authored two books with my wife, Melissa. Uh, simply put, they're the how and the why of, of the Netherlands uh, and the Dutch mobility system. Uh, but of course, if you want to learn more about the Dutch Cycling Embassy, we're at dutchcycling.nl uh, and all over the social media channels. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, I think that was enlightening. Most pedig Balog Samut szeretném felkérni Karácsony Ergely főpolgármester kabinet főnökét, hogy Beszéljen a budapesti kontextusról. Üdvözlök mindenkit, sokat ismerek, tekeződünk velük, úgyhogy szervusztok, sziasztok, köszönöm a lehetőséget, hogy, hogy beszéltek. És rendben van a, a fordítás. Már azt beszéltük az Áronnál, hogy a többség itt magyar, egyszerűbb, hogyha ha magyarul tartjuk, és Krisz akkor ért mindent abból, amit, amit mondok. Köszönöm a lehetőséget, hogy gyors bemutatkozási várostervező vagyok szakmában tekintve és az a nagyszerű lehetőség ért, hogy az elmúlt öt évben a főpolgármester kabinetfőnökeként dolgoztam, és ami még nagyobb szerencse volt, hogy ez nem csak egyszerű ilyen papírmunka, meg pecsétőrség, meg ilyesmit jelentett, hanem a város fejlődésével volt lehetőségem dolgozni. És hát úgy adódott, hogy ebből sok minden a kerékpározással történt, éppen azért, mert a kerékpározás egy nagyon olcsó és könnyű fejlesztési módja a városnak, úgyhogy hát van ebben egy kis történetünk az elmúlt öt évből. Miért csináljuk ezt? Nyilván azért, hogy adjuk vissza a várost az embereknek. Egy 10 perces előadásra kaptam lehetőséget, hogyha most kihagyom azt a részt, hogy hogyan áll össze az egész városfejlesztési stratégiánk, ami a lakhatási válság, a környezeti válság és a közlekedési problémákat fűzi össze egy, egy csokorban, és, és nagyon a, rámegyek a, a, a mai estének a témájára, hogy adjuk vissza a várost az embereknek és ebben egy nagyon fontos része a kerékpározás. Ugye nem azért fejlesztjük a, a, a kerékpározást, hogy azok, akik ma bicikliznek, azok nem tudom, jobban bicikliznek, vagy többet, hanem azok is, akik ma még nem, azok is tudjanak, és azok is jobban érezzék magukat a városban, akik soha nem is fognak biciklizni, mert azt gondoljuk, hogy egy, és akkor ez lehet, hogy plágium, de hogy egy olyan város, ahol jó biciklizni, ott jó élni is. Van azonban néhány ilyen hivatalos célja is a városnak, ami ezt alátámasztja. Elsőként itt a közlekedési célokat említeném meg. Itt most már hát több mint tíz éve van a városnak egy politikai konszenzussal elfogadott és újra és újra megújított mobilitási terve, ami azt tűzi ki, hogy hát most éppen 2030-ra érjük azt el, hogy miközben minden második utazás az közösségi közlekedésre történik, minden tizedik utazás az legyen biciklivel. És bár rengeteg minden fejlődik kerékpározásban, de még azt látjuk, hogy azért még sok mindent kell elérni, mert bizony ezen a kétszázalékos szintet zárójel azzal a kutatási technológiával, ami nem biztos, hogy ebben tökéletesen meg, megbízható, ettől nem tudunk elrugaszkodni, úgyhogy közlekedési célok egy egyértelmű irányt mutatnak nekünk, vannak klímacélok, és 
Itt azt szerepel, hogy 2030-ig minimum 40%-kal csökkentsük a széndiokszid kibocsátást. Nyilván itt a közlekedésnek van egy jelentős szerepe, de ehhez képest már ambíciózusabb célja is van a városnak, hiszen Budapest tagja annak a 100 plusz klímasemleges városnak, akik azt célozzák, hogy 2030-ig a klímasemlegességet, vagy legalábbis egy ahhoz vezető, ahhoz közelítő célt elérjenek. Úgyhogy nyilván a klímacélok is ezt szolgálják. És közlekedés biztonságban is a városnak már van egy, egy nagyon fontos, újabb stratégiája az közlekedés biztonságról, ami azt célozza, hogy 2050-re nullára csökkentsük a halálos közlekedési baleseteket úgy, hogy 2030-ig megfelezzük ezeknek a számát. Az elmúlt durván tíz éves időszakban, inkább hogyha a koronavírus válság előtti éveket nézzük, akkor átlagosan hetente egy budapesti veszítette életét közlekedési balesetben, ezt szeretnénk nullára csökkenteni. Um, nagyon sok eredményt lehetne mondani az elmúlt ciklusból, és ajánlom is, hogyha valakit érdekel, az a budapest.hu-n az eredmények fül alatt nézze nyugodtan meg. Én most csak néhány nagyobb történetet emelnék ki, ami azt mutatja, hogy mik azok a fő elvek, amik alapján szeretnénk előre haladni. Nyilván egy megkerülhetetlen tényező minden városban az, hogy hozzá kell nyúlni a közszületeknek a felosztásához, hogy mennyi helyet adunk gyalogosoknak, autóknak, közösségi közlekedésnek, bicikliseknek, zöldnek, és, és ez egy fontos issú, ráadásul ez nagyon egy konfliktusos terület. Gyakorlatilag elmondhatjuk azt, hogy Budapest azokat az alacsonyan csüngő gyümölcseket, amiket lehetett megvalósítani például a kerékpár sávokkal, anélkül, hogy hozzá kelljen nyúlni máshoz, tehát anélkül, hogy érdeksérelmet okoznak másoknak, ezt már az előző, tehát a 19 előtti ciklusokban elérte. És, és, és most már muszáj, muszáj néha konfliktusos helyzetbe belemenni. Itt egy olyan példát látok a, a nagykörútról, ahol ami, ami, ami egy ilyen történet, ahol ugye a koronavírus járvány alatt a kétszer két sávból eltérő, szakaszosan eltérő, de, de egy sáv elvételével alakítottunk ki kerékpársávot, és ez nem egyedül volt, hiszen ebben az időszakban a Bartók Béla úton, a Baros utcában, Máshol is, később még az Üllői úton történt új kerékpársávok létesítése, korábban más sávok, másként használt sávok felhasználásával. Nagyon fontosnak tartom a fizikai elválasztást, a védelmet, amiben persze nem tudunk rögtön olyan minőséget hozni, mint amit, mint amit szeretnénk, elsősorban finanszírozási okokból, de itt is egy, egy úttörő szerepet szánunk azoknak a védett kerékpársávoknak, amiket ezekkel a zöld polerekkel, rugalmas polerekkel védünk. Ugye ez a kép az Üllői úton készült, de, de van ilyen a Váci úton, a Szent István körúton is, és a következő időszakban és újabb és újabb helyszíneken fognak megjelenni. Ugye most már Budán is vannak a, a Irinyi, uh, hogy? Bartókra is adtunk valamit, igen, az Irinyi van hosszabban is, és ezeket szeretném még továbbra is elterjeszteni, azzal, hogy csak hogy ne akasztuk túlságosan össze a bajszunkat főépítészúrral, hogy alapvetően ezeket a pollereket vagy átmeneti, tehát egy ilyen néhány éves megoldásként képzeljük el, vagy azokon a részein a városnak, ahol nem kiemelt vagy más szempontokat felülíró szempont a, a városkép. Fogok majd később beszélni a nagykörút kapcsán, hogy mik az újabb elképzelésünk ebben a témában. Ugye sokszor a, a kerékpározás és a közösségi közlekedés kerülhet konfliktusban, de sokszor nyerhetnek mindketten. És a Lánchíd erre egy példa, ahol azt gondoljuk, hogy, hogy nagyon fontos lépés történt akkor a Lánchíd szempontjából, a budai belső kerületek és a pesti belváros szempontjából, de az egész város szempontjából is, hogy a, a korábban az autóforgalom okozta dugók helyett egy gyakorlatilag gyors kapcsolatot hoztunk létre Buda és Pest között, amit a ugye buszok, taxik és kerékpározók, motorosok tudnak használni. Ugye a Láncid építése jól megelőzte Budapest létrejöttét, tulajdonképpen az egyesítést, és már akkor is előre vetítette a két városnak az egyesítését. Mi most azt reméljük, hogy a Láncid egy, egy fenntarthatóbb város képét vetíti előre. Nagyon fontosnak tartjuk, hogy, hogy ez egyébként egy társadalmi bevonással jött létre, tehát hogy a budapestieknek volt lehetősége szavazni erről a kérdésről, és azt gondoltuk, hogy talán nem ismerünk már fel az a téma, hogy vissza kéne engedni az autókat a, a láncidra, de hát az ember mindig meglepődik. Ezt tulajdonképpen 
tulajdonképpen jó, hogy nem unalmas az élet. A Molbubit szerettem volna mindenképpen megemlíteni, ugye itt a 14-ben indult el az első generáció, 21-ben indult el a második, ami egy hatalmas ugrás volt az elsőhöz képest, hiszen mostanra gyakorlatilag tízszeresére növeltük a, a felhasználását ezeknek a, ezeknek a bicikliknek. Az induláshoz képest megkétszereztük a, a bringák számát is, és folyamatosan terjesztjük is a, a, terjesztjük ki a hatótávolságát, tehát új állomások létesítésével, hogy hol lehet a bubikat használni. Azt gondoljuk, hogy a, a, a bubi az egy igazi nagykövete a biciklizésnek, és, és, és talán az az eszköz, amit a leg észrevétlenebbül tud használni az ember, ha biciklizik. Ugye itt elhangzott előttem, hogy a, hogy a biciklet nem kell az identitás, nem tudom, kiterjesztő, vagy így a, az embernek a, egy, 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 egy hozzánőtt eszköznek lenni, hanem csak egy sima eszköz, amit tudok használni. Én magamban is el tudom mondani, hogy a saját biciklim az egy kicsit az identitásom része, de az, hogy mikor pattanok fel a bubira a belvárosban, szinte fel se tűnik, és teljesen természetes, hogy napi szinten használja így az ember. És, és egyébként nyilván nem csak a kerékpározással, hanem általában a szelíd vagy aktív közlekedési módokkal is foglalkozunk. Rengeteg új zárulát létesítettünk a belvárosban és külsőbb szakaszon és hármas metró felújítása kapcsán, és olyan szimbolikus helyeken is, mint a Blaha Vizetér vagy a Nyugati Tér. Azt gondoljuk, hogy ennek alapnak kell lennie, hogy, hogy egyszerűen, biztonságosan, felszínen lehessen közlekedni dalogosan is. És akkor nagyon röviden csak néhány olyan történetet szeretnék felvetíteni, ami a következő ciklusban szándékunk szerint meghatározója lesz ezeknek a fejlesztéseknek. És utólag, amikor itt ültem és gondoltam át a fejemből, hogy miről fogok beszélni, akkor tűnt fel, hogy nagyon sok díja párbálítható, tehát ismétlődik abban a szempontból, hogy csináltunk már valamit az előző ciklusban, mondhatni úgyis, hogy taktikai elemekkel, nagyon olcsón, nagyon gyorsan, és most szeretnénk ezt jóval több pénzből, jóval nagyobb előkészítéssel, egy jóval magasabb minőségen megvalósítani. Ezek közül a nagykörút az egyik, ahol mi hangsúlyozottan nem csak a kerékpározásról szeretnénk beszélni, nagyon fontosan tartjuk a zöldítést, minimális hely van, de legyen több zöld, nagyobb gyalogos, vagy szélesebb gyalogos felületek, alapvetően a teraszoknak a rendszabályozásával, élőbb üzlethelységek, kereskedelem, de fontos a kerékpározás is, és gyakorlatilag egy olyan minta szakasznak szeretnénk ezt használni, ahol már tartós minőségi kialakítással, fizikai elválasztással tudunk olyan biztonságos környezetet adni a biciklizőknek, amit tényleg kicsalogatja a, akár a gyerekekkel kerékpározó szülőket is. Van a rakpart, amivel szintén évek óta foglalkozunk, és a tervezés is most már nagyon fontos fázisában érkezett, és az a reményünk, hogy a következő ciklusban meg is tudjuk valósítani az átépítését a parlamenttől egészen az Erzsébet hídig, illetve az irányi utcáig. Itt is csak egy rész a kerékpározás, mert alapvetően itt ez egy nagyon nagy léptékű gyalogosító projekt, aminek viszont egy felvállalt és fontos része az, hogy, hogy végig lehessen kerékpározni a Dunapart mentén biztonságosan, sőt, hogyha kitekintünk ennek a konkrét projektnek a, a távlatán vagy területén, akkor az az elképzelésünk, hogy egészen éjszakon a Rákospataktól délen a Rászkevei Dunáig végig lehessen úgy biciklizni a Dunaparton, hogy szinte ne is kelljen autós közlekedést keresztezni. Tehát tényleg egy olyan nagy minőségű, magas minőségű kerékpáros útonat hozzunk létre, ami Budapesten tán ma még elképzelhetetlen. Nem említettem a nagykirútnál, de a rapartnál is minden kettő esetében releváns, hogy uniós forrásokból tervezzük megvalósítani, úgyhogy reméljük, hogy ez létre tud jönni. Nagyon fontosnak tartjuk nyilván a közösségi közlekedés fejlesztését. Most külön diát itt nem hoztunk a vasúttal való együttműködésre, pedig a BKK, illetve a, a Főpagyasztói Hivatal éppen most dolgozik egy ilyen közös kampányon, és a népszerűsítsük. Lehet, hogy nem a legmegfelelőbb időpont most a vasúti szolgáltatásoknak a népszerűsítése ezen a ponton a megbízhatóság tekintetében, de azt gondoljuk, hogy attól még ez egy fontos téma, és, és eljön majd a, az, az ideje. És hát vannak olyan helyek még a városban, ahol a közösségi közlekedés és a kerékpáros előben részesítés jó alapja lehet szerintem a, a, a fejlesztési terveknek. Itt éve a szabadságidat látjuk. Készülünk a, a Bubi harmadik generációjával. Ugye ezek most már ilyen fix ö, időszakra létrehozott megkötött szerződések, és a 2.0 lassan lejár. 
És a harmadik generációval az a célja a békekenek, hogy legalább egy akkora minőségbeli és rendszerbeli ugrást jelentsen a, a, a harmadik generáció érkezése, mint a második. Azt hiszem, azt stabilan vagy biztosan állíthatjuk, hogy szeretnénk megduplázni, a 2021 óta megduplázott kerékpárszámot még megduplázni, vagy akár még tovább emelni. Jelentősen nagyobb területre szeretnénk a bubit elvinni, külső kerületekbe is a nagy, nagy lakótelepeket szeretnénk mind elérni. Nyilván itt nagyon fontos, hogy együtt járjon ez az infrastruktúrával, tehát úgy érdemes kivinni valóval a bubit, hogy, hogy lehessen, tehát meg az a connectivity, ami a, a használhatósághoz szükséges, és hát az elektromos bicikliket is szeretnénk elhozni Budapestre az új bubival. Emellett sűrűbb lerakási lehetőség, a mobipontok bevonása, tehát egy nagy, nagy gurítást szánunk majd a 3.0-ával is. És néhány ilyen egyéb következő ciklusra szóló cél, az egyik az, hogy minden híd legyen könnyen átjárható. Ugye Budapest esetében a Duna nagyon meghatározó szereppel bír, a mostanság ezekben a napokban szokásosnál is nagyobb mértékben és bizony a hidak átjárhatóság alapvetően határozza meg, hogy mennyire könnyű biciklizni a városban, és azt látjuk, hogy, hogy ebben van bőven tennivaló, hiszen hiába történt meg mondjuk a Margit híd esetében a felújításakor, már régesség ki van nőve, jobban nagyobb forgalom használja. A lánc híd ebből a szempontból nyilván egy előrelépés, de be kell látni, hogy önmagában a lánc híd sem elegendő, hogyha nincsen meg hozzá az azt kiszolgáló, vagy azt elérő infrastruktúra, de ott van az Erzsébet híd, ott van a Szabadság híd, ahol ez ma kultúráltan nem megoldható, és ott van a Petőfi híd, ami a mi terveink szerint a következő nagy felújításra váró hídunk, amit már úgy készít elő a BKK, hogy azon rendes, mindkét oldalon, bologassanak majd ezek a főket a BKK kollégák, hogyha rosszat mondok, szóval mindkét oldalon rendes szélességgel jöjjön létre kerékpáros infrastruktúra. Alacsony a sebességhatárok, nagyon fontosnak tartjuk, ez nyilván kapcsolódik a közlekedés biztonsági céljainkhoz, hiszen teljesen más, hogy valaki 30 km per órával közlekedő, vagy 70 km per órával közlekedő autóval szenved mondjuk egy balesetet, éppen fordított előbbi esetben, 10-ből 1 esetben, vagy 10-ből 9 esetben valószínűleg túléli. A gyalogos 70 km per órán ez pont fordított ez az arány. Tehát nagyon fontosan tartjuk, hogy ebben legyen előrelépés. Egyébként éppen most a mobilitási hét alkalmából a BKK talán tegnap vagy tegnap előtt tartott is egy újabb egyeztetést rendőrséggel, kerékpáros klubbal, autóklubbal, másokkal, mert az a célja, hogy a már elfogadott közlekedés biztonsági stratégiához tartozó autós hálózati tervhez illeszkedően el is induljunk ebben, és valósítsunk meg sebesség csökkentéseket. Ezek között vannak olyanok, amik a belvárosban felszámolják a fölöslegesen régről megmaradt magasabb sebességeket, vannak olyanok, ahol egyszerűen akkor a gyalogos forgalom, hogy, hogy érdemes még tovább csökkenteni, és vannak olyanok is, ahol hullámzik a sebesség határ, tehát 70 és 50 között változik mondjuk, és 50-esek azért, mert ott vannak zebrák, nyilván akkor kevesen lassítanak le ezeken a szakaszokon, úgyhogy nagyon fontos, hogy inkább egy, egy egyenletes és biztonságos sebesség határ tudjon meghatározni. És mindenféle más kerékpáros szolgáltatást is szeretnénk fejleszteni. Ugye az előző ciklusban, vagy hát a mostani ciklusban rengeteg kerékpártámaszt hoztunk létre. Ugye itt egy mobipont uh, uh, található, vagy uh, igen. Talán így a, csak a kükőjéknek a kritikájára gondolom, hogy most ezek hogyan látszódnak. Ez kb. olyan, mint egy, egy autóreklám, amikor egy üres városban uh, szágód az autó. Tehát egy mobipont, ami nincsen tele rollerrel. Uh, nyilván itt kell, kell foglalkozni ezzel a témával, egyébként uh, büntet is a főváros ezeket a szolgáltatókat, hogy a megengedetnél több rollereket, uh, rollert helyeznek el, de, de nem csak a kerékpároknak a letámasztása, elhelyezése, de például egy, egy jó irány, egy fontos irány az út, uh, útvonal tervezésben, a Budapest gót uh, minél jobban bevonjuk ebben, hogy uh, nekem személyesen egy ilyen, uh, egy ilyen egy nünükém, amivel majd fogom, kollégákat fárasztani, hogy van egy, egy tök átgondoltan kitalált kerékpáros térképünk, így a különböző viszonylatokat a közösségi közlekedéshez hasonlóan megnevezve, elszámozva. Ez szerintem például sokat segítene abban, hogy az emberek, akik tudják, hogy a hármas metró már megy, tehát hogy azt hogyan tudják használni, de hogy hogyan tudnék azon az úton biciklizni, én tudom, én már kitapasztaltam, meg a BKK-nak az ilyen kinyitható térképeit megtanultam, 
de ebben azért vannak szerintem lehetőségek a városban is az ilyen wayfinding megoldásokban. És még ha, ha támaszok, akkor a, talán a, a fedett bringa támaszokat emelném ki, amiből ugye volt egy közösségi közlekedés, vagy közösségi költségvetési projektünk is. Tehát, hogy igyekszünk a, a, a kerépás sávokon és kerépár utakon azokat az egyéb szolgáltatásokat is fejleszteni, amelyek fontosak, hogy kényelmessé és könnyen választhatóvá tegyük a kerékpározást. És már így is túloktam, azt hiszem, a 10 percemen, úgyhogy, úgyhogy köszönöm szépen a figyelmet, és nagyon várom a közös beszélgetést, hogy beszéljünk. Én éltem szintén Hollandiában, úgyhogy megtapasztaltam azt a kerékpáros infrát, ami ott van, de, de izgalmas látni a, a mögötte lévő gondolatokat és elveket is. Köszönöm szépen! A jegyzőkönyv kedvéért szeretném elmondani, hogy elmúlt 7 óra a munkaidőm lejárt, úgyhogy most átváltok újságíróra, és nem hivatalnokként fogunk feltenni a kérdéseimet. De majd a kérdésekből látom. És szeretném, hogy szóltam sem. I just said that my uh, work hours are over, and now I switch to journalist, and then I can uh, interrogate my <laughs> one of the head of cabinet. Is that not working? Ilagi. Okay. So first question. Um, we saw all these nice examples from the Netherlands, but I guess it's irrelevant because they are small cities and this is a metropolis here with nearly two million inhabitants, right? Yeah, I think it's, it's interesting because um, well, yeah. <laughs> I can talk about Delft, and I often get the same pushback, right? It's, it's 100,000 people, it's a village in comparison to a lot of metropolitan areas. Even Amsterdam itself is only six, 700,000 people. But I, I think the argument we often make is you cannot look at these individual cities in isolation. And in fact, the Randstad, which is the greater metropolitan area of Amsterdam, Rotterdam, The Hague, Delft, Leiden, Utrecht, etc., etc., is actually eight million people, and it is forms this polycentric megacity uh, that is rivals Paris, it rivals London, uh, of eight to ten million people, and 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 is well connected, obviously, by walking, cycling, public transport, and the densest motorway <laughs> network in Europe, by the way. Um, so. Uh, I mean, because they've stopped their cities from sprawling into each other, uh, each, main, each city in the Netherlands maintains its own identity uh, and its own compactness. But at the end of the day, we really should be talking about the Randstad as one mega city rather than uh, Delft or Amsterdam or, or some other city in that conglomeration. Shamu, for you, which was the most interesting part in Chris's presentation and the movie, or what would be the first thing that you would do in the next term, starting in October? Well, certainly the principle with the, the three different uh, aspects, so the hardware, software, and worker, because, uh, you know, we, we build, I mean, of course, not a lot for what uh, we would like to build, but still, we, we do a lot of uh, effort in building new infrastructure. And uh, sometimes we see um, good numbers, but sometimes we would hope more for more. And uh, this makes me think like what, what we should do with the hardware and the software. Uh, so that's something I will take with me and uh, I think about that. What's the first thing we will do in the, the next term? Or what was the most inspiring for you maybe? In terms of order or software, for example, because it's not so uh, expensive as building bicycle bridges or tunnels. Yeah, what I think was missing from the from previous years to be proud of what we achieved and what we want to achieve. So a lot of things we, we have done, but then we stopped talking about that, or we haven't even started talking about that. For example, with the bike route. And now that we will uh, start this new project, I hope we will start uh, telling people why we do that. And, uh, and, and I believe this is uh, necessary for, for the success. Because, um, you know, these, um, these projects create uh, a lot of tension, of course. 
and if we are not telling the people uh, why we do that and how it will uh, be good for them, how they will benefit for it, uh, it's impossible to, to achieve uh, uh, sustainable success. And um, if one, um, like one could say as a criticism that we were not clear about why we do that, how we do that, what is the, the goal with all those things, um, yeah, talking more about our goals and what and how we want to achieve is certainly one thing what we can improve. That's very good that you just mentioned because I think it's, it's a very lacking perspective in, in, in Budapest and also in Hungary. Chris, how does it how is it done in the Netherlands? If there is a new project, do they promote it? Or is there any need for promotion? And if yes, how, how it's done? Yeah, I think for regular links in the network, there's very little software that's required because yeah, it's just people will use it and are already using it. And with the cycling mode share being 50 to 60% in most cities, it's not like you need to convince people to use it. I think one area where this has become particularly relevant is with these new cycle superhighways that they're by building that are longer distances because people are still stuck in their previous travel patterns of behavior, uh, jumping on the train or jumping in their car um, and don't think of cycling as an option for, for those types of distances. And so they've really, from, from the construction of, of these cycle paths, they've really worked to build money into the budget to have a communication strategy, brand the cycle superhighway, have a naming competition, have a, a logo and uh, yeah, definitely a ribbon cutting with the, uh, the elected officials that help make it happen so that you can get in the newspaper and make people aware that this is a possibility. Uh, in some cases they've tried uh, incentivizing yeah, through mobile applications and other um, well, the, the incentive that I, I mentioned about the, uh, the per kilometer reimbursement, I mean, these are just little things that they can do to help people, nudge people in the right direction. And they may not use this infrastructure, especially the longer distance, five days a week, but if they give it a try two or three days a week, that's at least a start. Um, it's not all or nothing. So uh, if I understood well, at uh, the big projects there, uh, the communication is part of the process. Um, who does this process? The municipality. Um, the communications team of the municipality, or there's a bicycle team, or, and who organizes the whole? Yeah, team? no, it's, it's, it's certainly a coordination between the cycling team and the communications team, and I think uh, there's an understanding that the comms team maybe doesn't necessarily get the, the finer details of why this is being done and, and how to sell it or promote it. But um, yeah, I, I think uh, if you're in some of these cycle highways, we're talking about a budget of 18, 19 million euros. You know, the least they can do is set, uh, in some cases, it's maybe 500,000 aside to hopefully help it achieve its p potential and make people aware of it as soon as possible. And, um, but it is, uh, yeah, even in the Netherlands, people still need to be reminded that, that the bike is an option. Uh, okay, that's interesting. Is there any special target audience that should be targeted with campaigning for cycling in general, that cycling is cool or, or to promote cycling in any ways? Like you said, the baby boomer generation is the most cycling generation. Yeah. How about the youngsters or how about uh, special demographics? Are we, we're talking in an international context now or in, in the, the Dutch, Netherlands? In the Dutch context. Yeah, I think there is very much uh, a growing understanding that uh, even in, in Cycling Paradise, there are groups that have not uh, adapted cycling. And, and one of the main focus areas right now, for the, particularly for the national government, is uh, how did they call them in the movie? Immigrant people. <laughs> and then <laughs> and, they showed And then they used the shot of Melissa and I. It was perfect. Um, yeah, because I think newcomers come to the Netherlands and they're stuck still in their same patterns and they assume a car is going to be the first thing they need to buy um, and, and don't think of cycling. Uh, whether they come from uh, cultures where cycling is 
even prohibited, like in Middle Eastern countries or in Canada or New Zealand, where it's also not very prevalent. Uh, they also don't think of cycling as an option. And so there is a, an outreach and a, a, a targeted effort, firstly, to give them the skills they need to get on a bicycle, because a lot of them maybe never learned to ride a bike or, or uh, haven't ridden a bike in, in decades, uh, to build up their confidence, to build up their skills. Uh, and there are specific nonprofits that are funded by the municipalities and the provincial governments um, to uh, do this type of outreach, in, uh, particularly in immigrant communities. So that is certainly one of the main focus areas right now because, um, yeah, they're, I mean, they certainly statistically aren't using cycling as much as native born Dutch people. I'm turning to Sean now, but please prepare your questions because after that we are going to hand out a microphone for those who will raise their hands uh, visibly. Uh, Gergo will help me with that. Um, in the film and in, in the presentation we saw that there was this defining decade in, in the big change for Dutch cycling, the 70s, where there was this uh, traffic safety crisis and then the oil crisis. And I couldn't avoid to, to draw this um, parallel example with Hungary that we had the COVID crisis where the roads were empty and people started cycling and the city started to, to paint new bike lanes and, and paint bike lanes where it was impossible before that. Uh, but we have a traffic safety crisis and um, there were, we have a new traffic safety strategy for one year now. Um, we had huge outrage last year um, with the accident or murder, some people say, on Arpad Bridge. Um, do you think, Shamu, that the city did efficiently in, against this crisis? You said that statistically one person dies every week uh, in traffic. Yeah, I think the situation is a bit different. And I'm not saying it as an excuse, just uh, if, you, if you look at the two cases, they are different because uh, you know, the, the oil crisis, uh, it, it hit the, the car use. People couldn't use their cars because uh, there was no oil or it was very expensive. But uh, the pandemic hit uh, public transport, most importantly. Uh, still, we, uh, we haven't uh, recovered from the pandemic. Less people are using uh, uh, buses, trams, metros. Metros is ex ex extreme. It's like uh, almost 30% less people mm -hmm. using uh, metro lines than uh, bef uh, before the pandemic. So it's very different, the two crises, because um, uh, actually m more car users were after, uh, after the pandemic. And uh, why we don't see more car um, journeys it's more because, you know, uh, home office and other digital solutions were also increasing. Uh, but there was a shift from, um, from the sustainable transport modes to, to the cars. That's, very, that's a very important uh, difference. And, um, and you know what we have seen in the movie that was, uh, I mean, I don't know how big that movement was. Because, of course, you can make a movie from just only, I don't know, 200 people protesting. Uh, but, but certainly I, I don't see that uh, in, uh, in, in Hungary or in Budapest. But of course, there are a lot of, um, I don't know, a lot of people participating in uh, I Bike Budapest. And, and this Sunday, that will be a critical mass um, yeah, event. So I don't know if in the case of Budapest or in the case of Hungary, it's going to be such an exact point in one decade when everything turns around or it's a, it's a longer, longer uh, process and it might be accelerating. So, you know, it, it, it's possible that in five years we will say that somehow we, we, we just uh, jumped a lot and now it's not two but eight uh, percent. It, 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 it is uh, possible. But, um, but certainly a very different case than the Netherlands. Okay. Of course, we can we cannot compare the, the civil movements and, and that kind of culture from the Netherlands in the 70s and how it is in Hungary. Yeah. But the main question is, I think, that, that is the city doing efficiently mm -hmm. 
to face this traffic safety crisis? Yeah, well, to be honest, and to answer this question, you have to look at what the most important uh, goals were for the city. And in this case, it was surviving. Surviving the, the, the pandemic, surviving the financial crisis, the energy crisis. Uh, the city made a very efficient job in this because we have survived, uh, the trams are running, um, the metro, the bus, the, well, you know, the state railway is not really working uh, that efficiently than the, the public transport in Budapest. You, you can use uh, water from a tap and so on. So we have all these facilities working, which was not, um, well, it was, uh, not, it wasn't the only case. So we could imagine collapsing everything and the city was very efficient in that. If we had like uh, peace time and we could have like a uh, solid uh, ground for our developments and we could have um, planned what to do in the next five years, then we could uh, achieve certainly a higher efficiency in terms of biking. So if you ask, no, of course, it wasn't uh, super efficient uh, in achieving our goals, but it is partly because we had um, more important goals in providing the people of Budapest those public services that they use every day. So is there going to be a budget for traffic, for the traffic safety strategy in the future? I hope so. I mean, it is a fair request. It is also a fair request to have um, a budget for, for maintaining the roads that we don't have now, or uh, a budget for for making accessibility projects or a budget for uh, supporting um, independent theatres. These are all fair requests and I hope we, have, we will have the possibility to have all of these. Uh, now we don't have these because of the financial uh, circumstances of the, of the city. So it's not a, a choice made by principles that uh, we don't want to give uh, a budget for uh, such developments. It's, it's, a, it's a choice of necessity. Chris, how is it um, that cities and the Netherlands have cycling strategy or traffic safety strategies or whatever strategies? Um, who decides where the money goes and, and, and what's the amount for, for the implementation of these strategies? Yeah, that's a big question. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, because uh, the Dutch are at the point now where they've been doing this for 50 years, a lot of the processes, a lot of the decisions, a lot of the budget, a lot of the designs are simply built into the mobility planning and road design systems. So there's no, there are very few dedicated cycling planners working within municipalities. There are very few dedicated cycling budgets because when a road get re redesigned, it's just understood that uh, a segregated cycle path will be part of that. Um, having said all of that, you know, they still need to find money for um, iconic projects, if you will, bridges, underpasses, bike parking facilities at railway stations. Um, these cycle superhighways, which are, are never coming from one pot of money, and, and really it is the job of the national government and the provincial government to find uh, the various stakeholders and negotiate deals that are, you know, funding coming from all different sources to make that project ultimately happen. I think what's very different about uh, the process in the Netherlands is every single infrastructure investment is looked at as an investment. It's not looked at as a cost. And in fact, the national government requires a social cost benefit analysis for every major investment over a certain amount and that means if you're going to build a cycling bridge it's not seen as a loss because ultimately that cycling bridge is going to keep bringing money back into the public purse through health care savings through reduced travel times through reduced maintenance through you know all of the reasons that we know getting people out of their cars on the bikes is going to ultimately save society over the lifespan of that project um, and this has been kind of the, the flip that's happened that's caused them to be able to find money for cycling where perhaps it didn't exist because 
when you do the inverse calculation for car-based infrastructure, not only is it incredibly expensive, but it costs society so much in terms of the crashes, the pollution, the, uh, the physical inactivity, and so on and so forth, the additional maintenance that's required because of the wear and tear of the cars. Um, it becomes very difficult to keep throwing money at a, at a car-based transportation system, and so they've realigned their priorities to find that better balance, uh, but it, it just comes down to looking at uh, mobility as an investment rather than a cost. I think that is a uh, good sentence to stop the conversation here next to the table. And now I would open it up to the audience. Um, lehet magyarul is kérdezni. Um, if someone is asking the question in Hungarian, then... Of course, yeah. Ki az első jelentkező? Ott is van. Uh, I'd like to ask about future proofing. <laughs> and uh, uh, in the film, uh, it was mentioned that uh, the kids have 15 minutes of uh, cycling lesson every week. And I don't know much about the uh, Dutch education system in the sense that I don't know whether the schools belong to the municipality or, or to the state. But I would like to inquire about how it was introduced in the education system, since when do you have that, and who provides the cycles, the bikes, for the schools, because I think that's a, a crucial point in, uh, in educating our children uh, uh, for sustainable uh, transportation. Yeah. So the, the traffic, traffic Safety Education Program is run by a national nonprofit foundation that is subsidized by the national government, much like the Dutch Cycling Embassy. Uh, and they provide, they develop and provide the curriculum, but it ultimately it's up to the individual schools whether they want to use it uh, and apply it. Um, the question of bicycles is an interesting one. Again, maybe because you are in the Netherlands, there's just an assumption that every kid has access to a bike. But um, I think in the instance that perhaps a child doesn't, um, there are programs um, where you can earn a bike or donate a bike um, to a, a child in need. They're called feeds banks, uh, bicycle banks. Um, Yeah, I can, I can uh, certainly connect you with the uh, non-profit foundation. Uh, it's uh, Vikir, Felix Vikir, Netherlands, Safe Traffic Netherlands. Um, if you want to speak to somebody there. Uh, exactly, exactly, yeah. But I know, uh, yeah, and I mean, in other contexts outside of the Netherlands, it's been left up to the school system to figure out how to teach kids to cycle, and that really... Um, has not been very successful because teachers have a million other things to worry about. So this is perhaps a model that they could be looking at. Fortunately, this is not a problem in Hungary. Um, so I'll be here, they said. Uh, any further questions? Questions. I have one question then. Otten, igazgató úr. But the microphone is needed, so, and it's there. If there are no questions, I have three, three more questions wow. uh, to, to fill the gap. Uh, one question would be, was there any discussion in the Netherlands to opt for a different model? Because you presented the uh, training network is the backbone of the mobility within the Netherlands, and you provide cycling as a feeder. As you know, in Budapest, we have a very dense mobility, um, public transport network, which is uh, providing uh, the feeder is usually walking, so uh, the Netherlands spends actually less on uh, public transport inside the cities. Uh, so was there ever a discussion to offer different models? So instead of cycling, to create a more dense public transport network with walking as a feeder, because that's that's our model we first. Uh, the other question would be, I would ask that uh, maybe I want to ask that other uh, 
about the others. The, the other questions, and my other question would be about fat bikes. I saw a lot of debate in the Netherlands about fat bikes. It's not well known in, in Hungary, but actually these are e-bikes with very uh, fat tires. What is your opinion on those? Are they good, bad? Because I see there's a campaign going on in the Netherlands to get rid of them or to regulate them. So thanks. <coughs> Um, the first question is a fantastic one, and, and my understanding is there wasn't really much discussion or debate. I mean, I think the Dutch stumbled across the bike train combination almost by accident. Um, as the story has been told, it was in and around the late 1990s that the railway company just noticed the sea of bicycles that were parked outside the railway stations and kind of decided, hey, maybe we should do something to stimulate this. Um, but as, as far as I know, I, I don't think it was part of any concerted plan until uh, they saw people who were already doing it and then decided to stimulate it even further. Um, but it, it, I certainly take your point that um, cycling within cities in the Netherlands certainly replaces a lot of public transport and even in cities like Amsterdam, public transport usage is quite low and, and the service is quite um, sparse and, and inconsistent, but uh, is that because of the cycling culture or is it the other way around? Is the cycling culture to fill the gap with public transportation? I think it's a, an interesting question. Um, the fat bikes is a fascinating phenomenon that I've been watching obviously as an outsider because it has absolutely captured the attention of the media particularly in Amsterdam because it is the most congested and gets the most attention. But if you, as an outsider, you would think that the fat bike is the most dangerous thing that has ever been invented because it is new and, and it's being, they're predominantly being used by teenagers um, who are hacking the speed limiters to potentially go faster than the limited 25 kilometers an hour. Um, it, it, it's definitely a problem and it's creating new challenges around enforcement. The police now have to do a lot of enforcement in terms of checking whether the bikes have been uh, hacked, uh, making sure that uh, if they're able to go faster than 25 kilometers an hour, they're not using the cycling paths. Um, it's creating new challenges on the cycling paths in terms of having to provide more space because um, the the current cycling system works because everybody largely goes in and around 15 or 20 kilometers an hour. When you start introducing even uh, a form of traffic that is 10 or 15 kilometers an hour more, it, it really has created a lot of stress and discomfort uh, and some safety concerns. I mean, they're not causing necessarily fatalities, but still serious injuries. So, I mean, I would, I often refer to it as a, it's a very, uh, luxury problem to have because still these teenagers are getting all the benefits of cycling. It's still pedal assist. They're still not having to be shuttled around by their parents. Um, but at the same time, um, because the Dutch system is so um, homogenous, it, it's so uniform, uh, it requires everybody to perf act in a very predictable and uniform manner. Uh, suddenly this newcomer uh, has really kind of disrupted it in a lot of ways. Um, and then there's the step scooters. And, and for those of you who don't know, step scooters are actually illegal in the Netherlands. They were immediately uh, banned by the national government, again, because I think they were seen as a challenge to the existing mobility system and they wanted to see... Sorry, to, just to clarify, is this the electric scooter that we have here? The exactly, ones? yeah. Okay. That you stand on and you don't really pedal. Um, they will be introduced at some point on a pilot basis, municipality by the municipality, but um, yeah, these, these kind of new forms of, of micro-mobility are really causing uh, problems on the cycle paths. One of the solutions, and Amsterdam is currently piloting this, is a blanket 30 kilometer an hour speed limit in certain neighborhoods with the understanding that faster cyclists over 20 kilometers an hour would use the roadway and mix with the cars. Uh, cyclists, slower cyclists, 20 kilometers an hour less, would use the cycle paths. Uh, but they're, they're scrambling. They really don't know what to do, and this is kind of a, a design solution that they're trying out. 
But because a lot of the streets are already 30 kilometers an hour, that becomes a more viable solution. There is one hand in the air and the second one down here. Uh, for those who are commuting, combining bicycle and, and the train, would they typically have like two bicycles and leave them at the station of each city? Or is there like um, a public bicycle network and they have one in their home, a known one in their hometown and then maybe use a public bike in the city where they work or how does that work? Yeah, it's a good question and it brings up an important point because I think when we start talking about combining cycling and transit, the immediate response in, in a lot of cities, especially American and Canadian cities, oh, we'll just put, let people bring their bikes on the trains. Uh, and we often discourage that because, well, it affects the capacity of the train, it affects the reliability of the train because of the time to load and unload the bike. But overall, it just affects the scalability of the system. It only works up to a certain extent before the system breaks down if you have too many bikes using the trains. And so the Dutch system is very much about leaving your bike at the train station, uh, hopping on the train, uh, and then uh, some people do have a second bike at their destination station. Some people do, uh, I almost on a daily basis, use the, the bike sharing that's uh, owned and operated by the railway company. It's a tap of the same card to borrow a bike for 24 hours. Um, but the, yeah, the system is very much to provide the bike on either end of the journey. But the, the fact that people are leaving a second bike at the railway stations is creating, again, a very luxury problem in that uh, they have all these bikes that are sitting there for weeks at a time uh, and, and taking up precious bike parking spaces for people who might <coughs> want to use them. Uh, and so they've had to introduce time limits and, and in some cases now it's 24 hour check in, check out. Uh, otherwise, you'll be charged for leaving your bike for longer than 24 hours. So there's, uh, I mean, a lot of effort to make it as seamless as possible so that you can go from the bike to the train. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's uh, nobody except for maybe recreational or touristic cyclists take their bikes on the train because it, it really just creates more problems than it solves. Next. Dutch people are allowed to bring bikes to buses, trains, and also metro lines. And the question for Sean is, when will Budapest allow bikes for metro lines? And more trains to come like today. Yeah, it's, um, it's actually prohibited on a lot of the uh, public transport lines, at least within rush hour. Uh, and then it's strongly discouraged outside of rush hour. On the train system, you actually have to buy a ticket for your bicycle if you do want to take it on. I think it's seven euros. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, I think it's just generally understood at a societal level that uh, you don't uh, take your bike on, on public transportation because most of the, the buses, trams, and trains are actually quite full uh, already and, and there's just not space. Yeah, uh, we have an existing program to, to make more and more buses and trams uh, able to carry your bikes. We already have done with, with some of them, uh, with the, the Tatra uh, tram, trams, and uh, now the next step is uh, doing the same with the PAF, the, the new trams. So hopefully that will happen. Um, well, for example, one big step would be making possible to take your bike on Metro Line 4, which would be possible according to the, the, the measures, uh, or there are you know, elevators and everything, but we have a debate with, uh, with those regulatory services if it's possible or not, but certainly we can uh, start again this debate. So yeah, there are some uh, low hanging fruits in this topic. We have about 
12 minutes to go, so if you have more questions, then please don't be afraid to raise your hand after the gentleman. Hello. Um, I have two questions, one from the, the other one from the municipality, and uh, that's about uh, Budapest. I'm, I'm a newcomer to Budapest, so I'm not really familiar with everything, but uh, as a cyclist as well, I can see uh, in my original city was hilly as well, so uh, I can see the challenges of uh, offering people uh, infrastructure for uh, cycling in the, in the hills, and especially in the suburbs or uh, more uh, uh, wealthier neighborhoods where people are really using cars as well. So uh, my question to you is if you are considering this and these uh, in these times, or you're still more focused on, on the most of the city, or do you have some plan for that, or it's in the future, what are you going to do about that? And um, about uh, the Netherlands, I was visiting in the Netherlands, I think, uh, uh, two years ago, but I imagine it's still the same. Uh, me and my partner were cycling uh, in the summer around the country, enjoying us, uh, ourselves very much, uh, but we did have some warmer days. Uh, when the warmest day, or the warm, I think, the hottest day uh, reached 40 degrees Celsius. <laughs> and when you think about the Netherlands, that's not uh, your usual, uh, what comes up to your mind. But uh, people stayed at home, didn't go to work. Uh, and they, the government called for that, and it was almost an emergency. And of course, people didn't cycle, but on other days, it, uh, uh, I guess it's an uh, incoming, increasing challenge, so do you have uh, any uh, programs for that? Yeah, for the first question, of course, there's a lot to do uh, in improving the cycle network uh, in the hilly Buda parts, but still there are a lot of parts in the city uh, which are flat, both in Pest and Buda, because you know, like, uh, Big Ashmaria or other Fala, they are also in Buda. So these big housing estates where a lot of people are living and uh, they still lack the, the, the infrastructure that they need for, for proper cycling. So I think we can reach more people with easier solutions uh, still on the ground. But, um, but for example, having the electric parks in the Hilubi scheme. That will, that will make possible to, to have the movie extended to, to the 12 districts, for example, or 7 districts, so those three parts. And yeah, I mean, I think um, extreme weather is, is going to be a challenge in a, a cycling city, uh, whether it's extreme heat or extreme cold or, or uh, extreme precipitation. Um, but perhaps, yeah, I mean, I think not as much as we perhaps think. And um, I've been out on, in Delft on a 40 degree day uh, and actually taken my camera out to kind of document uh, people cycling because I think uh, it's certainly something we hear as a Dutch cycling embassy from other parts of the world in Africa and Asia that cycling just will never happen here because we regularly get temperatures like that. And, um, at the end of the day, you know, it is providing people with choice rather than forcing them out of their cars. Uh, and there are subtle little things we can do in terms of providing tree canopy and shelter, um, incentivizing e-bikes to remove uh, the physical exertion required. Um, there's going to be a drop-off in any uh, extreme weather condition. Uh, and they do say that, you know, when in periods of intense rain in the Netherlands, probably about 10% of the cyclists will take another mode of transportation. They'll hop on the bus or they'll take their car. Uh, and you can actually plan for additional car traffic on, on rainier days. So people do switch between modes of transportation. Um, but it is, again, about providing a system that gives people alternatives and the ability to bounce between modes depending on what the weather's doing or whatever their plans are for that particular day. Hello, uh, I moved to uh, Hungary in 1989, and uh, since then I'm using bikes in the Budapest, I love it so much. But my 
question is, Bouchon, uh, how can you make a bicycle more attractive, attractive uh, to people when um, people who are not using bikes or are using bikes? the number of days snowing or raining then uh, it's not that bad in Budapest so we have quite nice weather actually uh, so I don't think um, that's the, the most important burden uh, but um, the most important thing that we should provide is safety that you are able to, to choose the bike without uh, near-death experiences which happens nowadays like if you bike a lot in Budapest or I don't know with me it happens um, so safety is the most important I think because then uh, it's gonna be a choice uh, which which is possible to make and you know with uh, with transport it's it's really good that um, you have people making a choice every day so it's not like that you buy a house in one district and then it's very hard to convince you to, to move another or to buy a house out of the city and convince moving back. But, uh, but choosing your transport mode, it happens with you every day, even if you have a car, you know, I have a car, uh, but still I use public transport or bikes. And uh, it's ma it makes possible to, to, um, to, to make people change their habits. And, and answering your question, the, the safety is the most important which comes with the connectivity of the network, uh, the separation uh, from, from higher speed or, or higher uh, traffic, and uh, all those five aspects that uh, Chris mentioned in his presentation. So that I think that's the most important when you want to make people choose bikes instead of cars. And that's exactly the point that I was going to make. And, and there has been academic research done on this, I think Munster University in Germany, who looked at the difference between German cyclists and Dutch cyclists during periods of extreme uh, rain and snow. And their conclusion was it just comes down to the quality of the network. Uh, if people know that they have a smooth separated space that's gonna be uh, plowed in the winter time, then they're much more likely to choose that as a means of transport um, because that perhaps yeah, rubbing shoulders with cars is uh, not a great thing on clear days, but when it's uh, raining or snowing, it's the last thing you want to do because the visibility is low and perhaps the, uh, the risk of, of skidding out is also low. So it, it just comes down to the quality of the infrastructure. And of course, we can say the culture <coughs> is more resilient and, and amenable to cycling, but that culture doesn't drop out of the air. It, it's really built around the infrastructure in response to the infrastructure that's on the ground. Thank you very much for your questions. I have a closing question to our guests. Um, just please answer shortly because we have no time. Um, how or where and when do the other mode of active mobility come into the equation, pedestrians or people walking? What's up with them in both? <laughs> countries and cities. Shamu can start. Well, actually, we are trying to make these things parallel because um, we believe that politically it's easier to convince people uh, with uh, 
to support these uh, developments when we are talking about uh, also about walking people, not just cycling people, because you know almost everyone votes. Um, so it's such an easier way to convince them. So you know when you are designing a new route or a new section, that you just uh, uh, take care about both. So at the when and where, the same time and the same place. Yeah, and I, I think everything I, I spoke about in terms of the design principles of the cycling network also apply to walking. And in a lot of cases in the Netherlands, the cycling infrastructure is designed in parallel with the walking infrastructure. And all of the design elements that I talked about, the raised and continuous uh, foot and cycle path that protect an intersection, um, they make for pretty good walking conditions too. I, I uh, do spend a lot of time walking around Delft, uh, probably more than I do cycle, and I, I do find, especially in comparison to Canada, uh, you do need an extra level of awareness because there is so much cycling traffic uh, around you. Um, but you know, the bike lanes, for example, shorten the crossing distance on roads. Um, they do distance you from the moving traffic when you're walking on the footpath. There are all these, I think, subtle little benefits that come with being a pedestrian in a cycling city, uh, despite that extra level of awareness that's required. So uh, the unfortunate thing we see now is because the car has dominated uh, our cities and our, our streets and especially the space, that it is uh, putting cyclists and pedestrians against each other in conflict because they are the ones left picking up the scraps of space that are left over from the car dominated system. And so they're often put in conflict with each other uh, and, and fighting each other for the scraps at the table. And I think at the end of the day, it's about giving them a bigger share rather than um, putting them in conflict because they aren't, in theory, they should be allies and, and complementary modes and not seen as, as uh, yeah, enemies, but uh, we've got a long way to go before that happens. Thank you very much for being here. Köszönöm szépen mindannyiatoknak, hogy eljöttetek. Remélem, hogy hasznos volt ez a mai alkalom. Nyilván egy csomó mindent nem tudtunk kifejteni, de még itt a kávézóban lehet folytatni a beszélgetést, és vigyétek magatokra ezeket a gondolatokat. Még szeretném felhívni a figyelmet arra, hogy a Városháza Park Gerlóci utca felőli részén van egy kis kiállításunk, arról szól, hogy Hollandia sem mindig volt Hollandia. Tehát az ottani átalakulás képeit mutatjuk be, hogy régen a Budapest-szerű Amsterdamból hogy lett Amsterdam, és hasonlók. Ezt nézzétek meg, ez a héten még kint lesz. Ezen kívül a BKK holnapján majd el lehet olvasni az autómentes hétvége programjait. Rengeteg nagyon érdekes program lesz. Gyerekeknek tényleg lehet csilingelni a villamossal, de lesznek városi séták, mobilitási témákban nagyon érdekesek, és lesznek olyan egyéb programok a kerékpáros oktatástól kezdve a holterek bemutatásáig, ami szerintem rendkívül hasznos és fontos. Ezt a bkk.hu-n majd meg lehet nézni. Szeretnénk megköszönni a Holland Nagykövetség segítségét, hogy létrejöhetett ez az esemény, illetve a kiállítás a Városháza Parkban illetve szeretném megköszönni a kollégáimnak, Nagy Zsófiának, Vas Gergőnek, Erdő Zoltának és a Klíma és Környezetügyi Főosztály többi tagjának is, hogy segítettek létrehozni az idei mobilitási hetet, és különösen ezt az eseményt. Úgyhogy, hát jó utat mindenkinek! <tos>